Good morning and welcome to Community Church. Our call to worship this morning comes from 1 Peter 1, 3, 9. In verse 3 it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And today, this morning, we're going to sing all about that resurrection power of Jesus Christ this morning. So will you stand and sing with us? The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior now to wash our feet. Now at His feet we bow. The one who bore our sin and shame now wrote in majesty the radiance of perfect love now shines for
morning, and in Jesus' name, welcome to Community Church. My name is Matt, one of the pastors here. Uh, if this is your first time worshiping with us, let me just say welcome. We're so glad that you're here. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, if you're worshiping online with a link in person, uh, feel free to grab some coffee or fill out a connection card in the front of you. That's a very formal way to just say we want to get to know you a little bit, help connect you with what's going on here at Community Church. Um, speaking of that, uh, two announcements I uh, want to just lay before you to remind you what's going on. Uh, the first is, there it goes. The first is uh, Snow Camp is coming up. If you're not familiar, Snow Camp, our students are all in the back. They're excited. Snow Camp is our winter retreat for our middle school and high school students. Um, we will be heading up to Camp Monadnock March 1st through 3rd. Two things that you need to do with that. Students, if you have not signed up, next Sunday is the deadline. Parents as well, if you're in on that. The rest of you all, just want to let you know that we will be sharing specific prayer requests over the next few weeks leading up to it. But even now, I want to invite you to be praying for our students, our leaders, and their families. Um, this is an awesome retreat, and we're thinking that about 30, 25 to about 30 students might be coming up. So we're very excited to be praying for them and what the Lord has in store. Second uh, reminders from the lay before you, our prayer team uh, is hosting a prayer night on February 12th. That's a Monday here in the sanctuary. Um, this will be a time of worship in song, uh, reading of scripture, uh, and really delighting in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, so laying uh, before um, the Lord different types of prayer, prayers of adoration, intercession. Um, they'll be gathering for worship and then breaking off into small groups to pray, to lay hands, to lift up requests to the Lord. And so uh, where else do you have a space to just in silence and stillness delight in Jesus? And so we want to invite you, uh, invite uh, family, friends who uh, would enjoy that and, and delight in that as well. Next Monday, 6.30 in the sanctuary. Um, we also want to remind you that if you have ballots from the annual celebration, there is a box in the back um, that we need those in there before you leave today. Katie is holding up the box. Um, that'll be right between the double doors. Be sure to drop those in if you are a member and have your ballots. Um, and we'll get those uh, where they need to go. If you'd stand, let's turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer as we turn our attention, continued in worship uh, to King Jesus this morning. Let's pray. God, you are the creator of the universe. You are good. Lord, you, at your word, everything was created. And yet you uh, bend down to hear us where we are, uh, to hear uh, the, the grief and the sorrow that weighs on our hearts. Uh, you know the, the delights and the celebrations that, uh, that we have. And you, you invite us to share those. And so we thank you that you've, the creator of the universe comes near to us. Lord, I, I thank you that you've come near to us uh, with such grace that you meet us even in our worst moments and extend uh, love and forgiveness and kindness, Lord. And I pray that you would, re this morning, re restore to us the joy of that salvation. Um, that it wouldn't just be a past event, but it would be a moment-by-moment moment, uh, delight uh, in who you are and the grace that you give us. Lord, we do want to pray even now for snow camp, for every student that you will bring up, for their families, for their friends, um, that you would work through them and draw them to yourself. Uh, just give them a hunger to know you and just the excitement and passion to, to unashamedly live for you when they go back to their schools, their teams, their friends. And we pray for uh, this uh, worship night or prayer night that it wouldn't just be a, a single event that happens here, but that um, the lighting in you would empower us to go back into our homes, back into our families, encouraged, um, emboldened uh, to just live for you. We do pray for our city. that As we go from this place, uh, your light would shine. That those who are in darkness would see your light. Those who need healing would know that you are the healer. Um, and that we would just be the best signpost pointing to you as best as we can. Jesus, we love you. We are yours. This time is yours. And so we want to lift you up. And as we do, that trust that you would draw all people to yourself. May you be glorified. And all God's people said, amen. Let's continue in worship.
course of these next couple songs, we invite you to, first of all, continue praising God for all that he is and all the glory that he deserves. Not to spoil too much, but Tim's sermon is a bit of a downer today, so this is our chance to, like, really lift him up high. Um, and also, during these next two songs, we invite you to bring forward your tithes and offerings as an act of worship. God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And in John 3:16 it says, "For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life." For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son.
Jesus, thank you that you came down to save the world. Thank you that your blood has washed away every sin, Lord, that you have come to cleanse us and make us new. I pray that this morning our hearts and our eyes would be fixed on you and that we would see you at work, both in the world around us and in us. I pray that your name would be lifted high this morning in this place. In your name I pray. This time we invite the kids, pre-K through fifth grade, to head to the back to meet the Sunday school leaders. Find the flow. I'll try and sneak in.
didn't get up here fast enough before the flow started going and out. Got to be, got to stay more on my toes. Let's see. Morning, everybody. Um, I wanted to start with a public service announcement that has nothing to do with preaching. And it, it's kind of ironic because we just started up the preaching team again for this next teaching series that we're doing. And one of the things we talked about is a pet peeve of mine when pastors begin by sharing a random joke or story that has nothing to do with the text, but just as like a crowd warmer upper. And then everyone's like, ha, 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 great joke. It's like, okay, let's get to the word. So this morning I'm going to start with something completely random that has nothing to do with the word. Public service announcement, the difference between dark chili powder and red chili powder. <laughs> if you were here last week at our annual celebration, you will know that I made a giant vat of chili and then I left some instructions for my wife just to finish the spices in the morning. And then in front of all of you, I was like, oh, look, there's a bus. Let me throw my wife in front of it. And the chili was way too hot, way too hot. And praise be to both God and Deanne for fixing my chili and adding some, like, tomato sauce and some extra tomatoes. It turns out there's a difference between red chili powder and dark chili powder. The red stuff, which is what we use, is really hot. This is just chili powder. So, I don't know if any of you knew that. If it doesn't look dark, don't use it. <laughs> and I'm sorry for throwing you under the bus. And that has nothing to do with what we're talking about this morning. This morning, I want to start with the question, who would be interested in being an Old Testament prophet? Show of hands, who wants to be an Old Testament prophet? No, I got one and a half, I think. <laughs> I had a, a hand went up and there was like, oh, no one else wants to. Okay. <laughs> and some of you are like, I'm not putting my hand up because I, Tim's probably setting up a straw man and then he's just going to smash the straw man down and I, he's probably trying to sucker me in. You're absolutely right. I am going to do that right now. But I kind of want to be an Old Testament prophet. Why would anybody want to be an Old Testament prophet? Well, here's why. If you read the beginnings of like all of those Old Testament prophetical books in the Bible, they all start with like, the word of the Lord came to Amos. I want in on that, right? Yeah, that part sounds good. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. Like, what, what do you think that was like? What were the mechanics of that? Is that like audible voice? Is that like I fell into a trance? Is that a vision, a dream? Is, I have no idea. But I would love just to be able to like mano y mano talk to God. I've got questions. I think he's got answers. But I would love to directly hear. From now, we do directly hear from God. You know, today we have access to God. He's speaking all the time, right? We have his word. Anytime you want to hear from God directly, open it up, pick a place, start reading. You've got access to God's his message for us right there in the palm of your hands. We get to pray. We have the Holy Spirit residing inside us. We can pour out our hearts. We can receive comfort or chastisement in accordance with our needs. We have Christian community where we can actually speak into one another's lives. And in all ways, we line things back up against the word to make sure that what we're hearing is consistent with who God is. So I'm not saying we don't hear from God today. I'm not saying God isn't speaking. I am saying I think it looked a little different with an Old Testament prophet. And I would love to have like, thus saith the Lord, Tim, you're doing a great job. <laughs> thus saith the Lord, let me tell you all about my loving kindness that endures for generation to generation. That's what I, I think it would be great to be an Old Testament prophet. Until someone actually reads an Old Testament prophet. And you take a look at what they were charged with saying. These were not popular people. And they were not popular for a reason. Right? Some scholars call prophets covenant enforcement 
officers. Well, that sounds intimidating. Covenant enforcement officer, right? God has made a covenant with his people. He says, I'll be your God, you be my people. Deal, deal. Let's put some blood on hyssop and shake on it. And he says, if you obey my commands, I will bless you. If you disobey my commands, there will be curses involved that will hopefully correct your course and get you back to the blessing part of obeying my commands. Now, thousands of years, we've gotten really good at not obeying Jesus' I mean, God's commands. So just before the curses would come, God would send one of these Old Testament prophets in. And the Old Testament prophet would come to, to the people and speak to the people, Thus saith the Lord, you're all steeped in sin. How do you think that would go over today? Same way it went over thousands of years ago. No change. Nobody likes being told they're steeped in sin. And so these prophets were not popular people. They were ostracized. They were kicked out. They were neglected. Some of their families left them and abandoned them, left outside the city gates. Some of them were beaten and stoned. Some of them were executed simply for trying to communicate what God wanted to say, which is not just you're all steeped in sin. That was usually the first part of the message because, you know, we're all steeped in sin. But the second part of the message, which was, so return to me, says the Lord. Sometimes they barely even got to that part. But they were, they were getting beat up and kicked out. Who wants to be an Old Testament prophet? Sort of, but not really. I think there's the answer there. Even the word prophecy is translated with a number of different options in English, right? An oracle, that sounds really mysterious and like magical. Or the more mundane, message. A message from the Lord. Veggie that's Veggie Tales, right? Which one? Which one? Is it Josh of the Big Wall? Um, yes, thank you. And no one's judging anyone for knowing that information. <laughs> but another word that's used to describe prophecy is burden. Prophets were burdened people. They had a message from the Lord and it weighed heavily upon them. This winter, we are going to be diving into one of these Old Testament prophets together by the name, well actually I'm going to put it on the screen. And on the count of three, let's pronounce it together. One, two, three. That was remarkably unified. <laughs> so I grew up in Canada, and we call him Habakkuk. And then I come down here, and everyone's like, Habakkuk. And I thought we'd take a vote, but I, I, I don't think it's necessary. <laughs> I guess I'm wrong. Habakkuk it is. Okay, no vote required. Habakkuk is an Old Testament prophet who was burdened. But one of the fascinating things about him, well, I don't want to let that out just yet, but just know he's, he's unlike any of the other prophets. So if you've got a Bible, I want to invite you to grab Habakkuk. What? In preaching team, we're just calling him H because we keep going back and forth. And I just want to commit to you now that I will probably, even within any given sermon, refer to him by multiple different pronunciations, depending on which syllable I choose to emphasize. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, is just the opening few lines of this prophet. Page 763, if you've got a Black Pew Bible. And we find these opening words. The prophecy, the burden that Habakkuk the prophet received. <laughs> o Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed. Justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. This is how the book of Habakkuk opens. 
Habakkuk is an Old Testament prophet who is crying out to God in faith. So as we turn our attention to this, just join me in inviting God's presence here. Father, we do love you and we need your Holy Spirit to illuminate your word to us. We delight that you have preserved these words for us for thousands of years and that they are words intended for us. And we ask that you would allow us and our hearts to perceive the meaning of these words and also how they connect to our lives and how they can provide hope and encouragement and challenge in today's world. We love you. We submit ourselves to your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Habakkuk. Let's start with like setting the state. Like where, where, where is Habakkuk anyway? Some of you, I actually heard pages turning, which is cool, not just uh, swipes on phones. If you're looking for Habakkuk, he's about here, right? Two thirds of the way maybe through. Is that really how we landmark people in the Bible? Not really. What is going on? You can't just jump into a book. You've got to know what's going on in history. You've got to know what's going on in the geopolitical world. You've got to know sort of when all the action's happening. We need to know a little bit more about what's going on in Habakkuk's day. So let's just do a, a quick, um, let's call it, survey of the entire Old Testament. Here we go. Starts with God creating the heavens and the earth, and we pretty quickly mess it up with sin. And so that <clears throat> in Genesis, you've got Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and Noah and some of those stories. Biblical history continues, and you get to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Yeah, we're familiar with some of these names, I hope. Biblical history keeps going. We get to Moses. Oh, the Exodus. I saw Prince of Egypt. Okay, we keep going. We get to King David, right? This great monarchy of Israel. Now, things go a little sideways after that. Let's just zoom in a little bit. David has a son named Solomon. Starts out great, pretty wise guy. And then uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, literally breaks the kingdom in half to which his grandfather David rolls over in his grave and says this is why we can't have nice things (laughs) the northern kingdom takes the name Israel the southern kingdom takes the name Judah so we're in here somewhere so even as you're just plotting everything you know about the Bible everything you know about you know go through everything you know about the Old Testament and you get right up through King David And then you get the northern and southern kingdoms as they split. Now, on on a map, that looks something like this. Oh, look, there's the northern kingdom, Israel. There's the southern kingdom, Judah. Northern kingdom took Samaria as its capital and built a competing worship center. Judah retained Jerusalem as its capital. Now, these two did not get along. But what we sometimes forget is that there's a larger geopolitical world involved and there's this little nation called Assyria sneaking up from the backside. And Assyria comes along and in like 722 BC just wipes up the Tigris, the Euphrates, around the Fertile Crescent, down through the northern and southern kingdoms, all the way to the Nile Delta. Please note, the northern kingdom is now gone. They are completely conquered, destroyed, and scattered by Assyria. And then, in sort of the hundred years that follow, uh, over time, you can see that even the southern kingdom is mostly conquered. It, turn, it, it has red overlaid on top. It's hard to see. I get it. But you can see that there's this little ring around Jerusalem itself that re- retained some of its own autonomy for a while. But eventually, you know, in trying to fend off Assyria, they partnered with Egypt, and then Egypt installs a puppet king. And then that doesn't work out And so then Assyria sends their own puppet king and demands tribute. And what we have is a season in the history of the people of God where it's monarchy, it's king. The Bible says, did evil in the eyes of the Lord. It was a season of idolatry and injustice. The leaders were taking advantage of its own citizens for personal gain. Injustice was rampant. And it was because there were these other nations involved putting their own agents on the throne and that had a trickle-down effect through all of the whole country what we see is that as habakkuk is being written 
Habakkuk's world was in chaos. As he looked around himself at the world in which he lives, it made no sense to him. This is what we see in verses 3, the last half of 3 and verse 4. He describes what he's seeing. Right? He says, destruction and violence are like right in front of my eyes. Everywhere I look, I see destruction and violence. He says, there is strife and conflict everywhere. The law is paralyzed in the face of the violence and the strife and the conflict. Justice never seems to prevail. It never wins. The wicked are like hemming in the righteous so that justice is perverted. This is not a nice description of the world in which Habakkuk lived, but it's an accurate one. One of the reasons we're studying Habakkuk is because that sounds really familiar today. And lest we think that these Old Testament prophet books are some dusty tome to be kept up on a shelf and mostly ignored, you read a text like that and you say, this might actually be written to us today, as if it was written yesterday. Habakkuk's world was in chaos. Now, it's not just that geopolitically, you know, Assyria and all the different nations, and this opening movement that Habakkuk brings to the table is, these are domestic issues that he's complaining about. This is God's own people. He hasn't even gotten to the larger geopolitical scene that's going on. He's literally saying, our king, our leaders, our chief priests, and the, the temple, and, and the whole system, the whole system is broken. We're supposed to be a people that honor the Lord and please him in every way. We're supposed to be a light to the nations, that they might see how different we are, and thus put their trust in the one true God. And Habakkuk looks at his own people who've been charged with that responsibility and says, none of this works. I also don't think this is abstract. This is not him saying, well, look at the current state of affairs in our national domestic policy. It's his own people. It's, I don't know if he had a brother. It's his brothers. It's his parents. It's his neighbors. It's the people that he bumps into as he walks through town and everyone's coming back out of the fields that are experiencing what it's like to live under ungodly leadership, under puppet kings who do evil in the eyes of the Lord, who nationally institute idolatry as national policy. When the leadership completely abandons their people and abandons God. This is not just about, oh, look, an int let me write a letter about the people of God and how they struggled. It's personal. Saying, this is my world. These are my people. These are my friends. This is my family that's suffering under this. Habakkuk opens by simply saying, this is not the way things are supposed to be. Sound familiar? This is not the way things are supposed to be. I think we can jump right in here and say, this is our world too. And even as we look at the, the, the national state of the church, at the, the churches that make headlines, it's usually not for good things. And we look... It would be nice if we could keep looking outward and outward and outward, but maybe we also need to be looking at our own hearts and saying our own hearts are just as easily corrupted. Our own hearts are just as easily swayed towards injustice. Our own hearts are just as easily swayed towards self-interest and the pursuit of gain and accommodation with the culture. not the way things are supposed to be. Maybe it's even just in the realm of you look at the world and you see suffering around you. I mean, as Habakkuk's saying, he's saying injustice is perverted, violence is all around. 
There is death, there is disease, there is suffering, there is pain. This is not the way things are supposed to be. So Habakkuk has to ask, is coming face to face with that reality. And I think every day so do we. Every day. We wake up in the morning and we're faced with a world that is broken. We're faced with our lives that are broken. We're faced with our hearts that are calloused and threatened to grow cold. And we say, this is not the way things are supposed to be. So what are the options? What do we do with that? Let me propose three options, two of which are not good ones. Option number one. Pretend all is well. Boy, that's the easiest one. Hey, how are you doing this week? Oh, good, good, I'm fine. Yeah, no, hey, how are you doing? Yeah, no, great, praise the Lord, yeah. Hey, let me pray, for, I'll pray for you too. Okay, well, good, we'll see you next week. We can just put on the mask. Pretend everything's okay. Doesn't matter if our hearts are breaking. Doesn't matter if violence is happening in our lives. Doesn't matter what trauma we're going through. Doesn't matter what heartbreak or misery. Doesn't matter what the state of the world is. We just put on a mask and pretend everything's okay. Like I said, two of these are terrible ideas. This is one of them. I actually think this is violence. I think something happens when you have to split your soul into what you're actually going through and experiencing and feeling, and then what you pretend and present to the outside world. And the more times that separation happens, the more your soul actually tears a little bit more. And eventually you forget that you're even pretending. And you bury the hurt so deep. Pretending all is well is not a way for everything to be well. It is the opposite. It is to increase the violence to your soul. Let's see if there's a better option. Hey, reject everything there is to know about God. How could you let it all happen like this, Lord? This is not the way things are supposed to be. So I'm going to take my ball and go home. I mean, what's the point? If I'm following God and the world looks like this, like what's the point of following God at all in the first place? Did I mention there are two options we don't want to choose? This is the second one. <laughs> Abandon the only one who can provide hope. That's what this option is. Not our best play. Let's look at a third option. Demand an answer. Look God in the eyes, shake your fist, and say, what's the deal? Sorry, demand an answer from who? From God? That seems a little risky. People who challenge God, it does not usually go well for them. All right. I'll grab the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> Dead. <laughs> Zechariah, you and Elizabeth are going to have a baby. No, we're not. We're like super old, and now you can't speak for nine months. Like, you don't, you, don't, you don't challenge God. Like, you just don't do that. Habakkuk's world was in chaos, but that's exactly what he does. Habakkuk demands an answer from God. Gutsy, right? Look at what he says. This is actually, you know, the verse 2 and the first half of verse 3. This is Habakkuk looking around him and seeing the violence and the injustice and the suffering and the brokenness, seeing an entire nation walking away from God, being led into idolatry. And he says, Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you're not, listen, you're not listening. Have you cried out like that to God? How long will I cry out for help and you don't seem to hear me? Or I cry to you, violence, look, look what's happening all around me. 
and you're not intervening to fix the situation. Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do I have to be right here? It's right in front of my eyes, everywhere I look. And why do you idly look at wrong? Ooh, that's an accusation. God, why are you in neutral? Do something. I really feel like Habakkuk's holding back. He doesn't seem to be pulling his punches. He seems to be confronted by a world out there among his own people in his own heart that's out of control, that's gone sideways, and he demands an answer from God. Habakkuk's world was in chaos. Yes. He demands an answer from God. Yes. And if you think I'm getting to God's answer this morning, you're wrong. I'm not. Because I want to draw your attention to this aspect of how the book of Habakkuk opens. Not once does God condemn Habakkuk's complaint. Let that sink in for a minute. Not once does God condemn Habakkuk's complaint? It's like nowhere in the rest of the book. It's not like God shows up and says, who are you to judge me? Can the pot say to the potter, who is it that darkens my counsel, who speaks empty words without knowledge? I kind of expected that here. And not only nowhere in the rest of the book, but nowhere in the rest of Scripture. It's not even like he's used later, like we all know what happened to Habakkuk. No. In fact, Habakkuk has some of the most beautiful quotes that are taken and celebrated elsewhere. Songs are written from the book of Habakkuk. I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Renew them in our day. In wrath, remember mercy. We're more than 500 years since the Protestant Reformation when Martin Luther was reading Romans, which quotes Habakkuk and saying, and the righteous will live by faith. And Martin Luther's like, whoa, salvation by faith through grace. It's one of the two. Habakkuk is this beautiful repository of some of the most amazing biblical truths that we've got. Nowhere is he condemned, not in the book, not in the rest of Scripture. Why not? Because Habakkuk demands an answer from God from a place of faith in God. Habakkuk demands, see there I go, Habakkuk. Habakkuk demands an answer from God from a place of faith in God. He's crying out from a place of faith. And it all comes down to this idea that things are not the way th they're supposed to be. Well, what are they supposed to be then? How would you know what they're supposed to be? Why are you complaining? Because I know who God is. And I know God is loving. And I know God is kind. I know God is a saving God, a redeeming God, a forgiving God, a God who loves justice, who's overflowing with mercy. And the only reason I know this is not the way things are supposed to be is because I know who God is, and this doesn't look like Him. Which means the complaint is rooted in faith in a God who is different from the world in which we live. The very fact that the complaint exists is evidence of Habakkuk's faith. His complaint was consistent with God's heart and character. His complaint is not saying, God, I wanted a unicorn and you didn't give me a unicorn. It's not a self, 
King James Version. We discovered last week downstairs that there are unicorns in the Bible in the King James Version. Go check out Job. <laughs> but he's not asking for things for his personal enrichment. He's not upset with things that have... I could hear, as he's, as he's arguing with God, as he's demanding an answer from God, I could actually hear God going, that's exactly right. You should be upset by these things. This is not the way things are supposed to be. I'm going to do something about it. In fact, the word complaint isn't actually the best word for this, right? The biblical word that's used for a complaint that arises from a place of faith in the love and character of God is actually called a lament. And the Bible is full of lament. Places where people come up against the world, their circumstances, their hurt, their pain, their suffering, injustice, violence, war, all of it. And they cry out to God and say, how can you let this happen? And yet, in all of these places, there's this little statement of faith. You know, you look at something like Job 1. If you've read the book of Job, you know that he gets tested by Satan. And, like, his livestock, some of them get carried off by raiders. Others get, like, burnt from fire from heaven. All the servants get put to the sword, except for the ones that were burnt by fire from heaven. And then all of his sons and daughters were partying at the house, and the house fell down on them. And he lost, like, he lost everything. And at all this, Job gets up, tears his robe, shaves his head, goes into full mourning, and he falls to the ground, wait, in worship? When was the last time that was your default response to complete and total suffering? Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will report, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away, may the name of the Lord be praised. And the Bible says, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. It was lament. Or we get into the Psalms. There's a lot of lament Psalms, right? Psalms that sound almost like Habakkuk. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Skip to the end of the Psalm. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Wait, what did he just say? Hold on, let me get back it up there. How long will you forget me forever? Hide your face, wrestle with my thoughts, sorrow in my heart. My enemy is triumphing over me for he has been good to me. Obviously, whatever the psalmist is going through, it's not the way things are supposed to be. But the complaint arises because he knows who God is and that God has been good to him. Even Jesus, I would argue, is, is in this kind of situation, the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He, just before he's crucified, he says to his disciples, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And he goes a little further. He falls with his face to the ground and prays, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. not as I will, but as you will. That in the midst of facing his own execution, he puts his faith in his Father. Lament is a big biblical category. And so when Habakkuk cries out to God, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. This is not him whining. This is him participating in a rich biblical tradition of what we do when all of this crap is too much for us to process and handle. When it's too much, when it's too much to handle, when it threatens to overwhelm, when we're brought to the end of ourselves and we have nothing left to offer, no resources left with which to face it, and we fall on our faces before God, Habakkuk gives us, by drawing in this biblical idea of lament, he he models for us what to do when the world is not the way it's supposed to be. And he demands an answer from God because he knows who God is. 
He knows what God's like. And he knows this is not the way it's supposed to be. He says, my, I'm crying out to you, violence, it's all around me. Will you not save? He says, why do you see, make me see iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Habakkuk is crying out to God, but he's doing it from a place of faith. It means we can cry out to God from that same place of faith. It means that crying out to God and demanding answers to these questions, not only will God not condemn that, he welcomes it. He invites it. He says, where else are you supposed to go but to God with these things? He offers us the whole biblical concept of lament and says, when the world is not the way it's supposed to be, when the church is not the way it's supposed to be, when your own life is not the way, when your own heart is not the way it's supposed to be, cry out to God. And he kept the book of Habakkuk in there for us for thousands of years to tell us that. We can embrace the idea of lament because God is big enough to handle it. He is not threatened by our shaking fists. Nor will he push us away when we make these demands. Right? This is an Old Testament prophet. This is a thus saith the Lord kind of moment. Like, We want this kind of relationship with God. I would love that kind of moment to hear from God. So from this place this morning, I think there's a couple lessons we can take from this. Number one, lament means you get to be real in the midst of the chaos. How about we not pretend? How about we not put on nice shiny masks and come to church together? How about when someone says, hey, how was your week? You're able to say, I am complaining from a place of faith. <laughs> I know who God is. I know what his heart is. I know what his character is. And I know the world I'm living in is broken. And until Jesus comes back, it's probably going to stay broken. And so until Jesus comes back, this could be kind of hard. And I love him and I'm confused and I don't have all the answers. If that's you, you're in the right church. That's what we say here. Be real in the chaos. I think number two, give it to him. Like, literally, let them have it. Cry out to the Lord. There's something that happens to our own hearts and souls when we actually unburden ourselves from that which we need to cry out about. It's as though the Lord meets us there, and as we empty out all of our... God replaces it with... Uh. Transcribe that, YouTube. Cry out to the Lord. The book has been given to us to give evidence to that as an appropriate and responsible way to handle this stuff. Pour out your soul to God. And then I think thirdly, sharing your lament in community. None of us are alone in this. Habakkuk is a book that was preserved for the people of God. It is normative. I'm not saying you need to necessarily write down and circulate a, like a, a letter to everybody in the church. Here's my complaint for God and like pass it around. Maybe you would. I don't know. It may not just not be like kept for 2,000 years of scripture. But the idea that you actually are part of a community of other people who are also trying to figure all this out. And we're also coming before God with their questions and their concerns. And that together, the posture of our community faith is one that puts our hope and our trust in the only place that is, that's worth putting it. In the hands of our God.
We're only like four verses in, people. <laughs> four whole verses. But we see Habakkuk's world was in chaos, and we're like, wow, that sounds like us. And then we see that he demands an answer from God, and we're like, we're allowed to do that? And not only are we allowed to, God doesn't condemn it. He welcomes it, invites it, <laughs> preserves it for thousands of years in the book of Habakkuk, and then offers it to us today. God says, lament. Your hearts should break when the world is not <laughs> aligned according to the heart and character of God. But as you do, Cry out to God from a place of faith. The whole reason we know it's not the way it should be is because we know the God who says the way things should be. Lord Jesus, we love you and we recognize even this morning that Things in our lives and things around us in the world are not the ways that they're supposed to be. And we want to join our hearts with Habakkuk and say, why? God, I pray, we haven't even got to the rest of the book yet. We haven't even got to how you answer yet. But even just hearing this morning, permission to ask why. Permission to say how long. Permission to say why won't you. Permission to, to say in light of what we know about you, the world around us does not seem consistent with who you are and what you're doing. Why won't you intervene? May we take encouragement that you're the kind of God who isn't threatened by that. Even better, you're not just not threatened, but you welcome it and model for us in a place like Habakkuk. You invite us to come before you and to lay our complaints before you from a place of faith, saying we know who you are. Help us understand. I pray that you would be meeting us where we are. I pray that you would be at work binding up the brokenhearted, Pray that you would be at work helping make sense of a broken and, and a world that is alienated from you. But may our desire to demand why never drive us away from you, but instead drive us right into your arms. And that your everlasting arms of love would surround even those of us who are shaking our fists at you like petul petulant children. Thank you for being a father who will hug us even when we're beating on your chest. We are so grateful to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we also get the privilege of celebrating the Lord's Supper this morning. And honestly, getting into Habakkuk would be kind of incomplete if we didn't get to do this. Remember that God actually does save. He did save. And he continues to save through what Christ endured on the cross on our behalf. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come head up. If the, those who are serving communion would join me at the front. And I want to give all of you a chance just to have some downtime with the Lord. Um, if if there are fists that need to be shaken at God, this is a good morning to do it. If there is an awareness of sin in your life that needs to be confessed, this is a great time to do it. Or maybe you just need to spend some time in gratitude, being so grateful, knowing that in spite of how broken the world is, our lives are, our heart is, Jesus wins. And our hope is in him. So take a few moments now of just quiet reflection and prayer. Uh, I'll close in prayer and then we'll continue celebrating the Lord's Supper in a moment.
Lord Jesus, we pause even this morning to remember your body that was broken for us, your blood that was shed for us, that you took the penalty for our sin upon yourself, for our violence, for our injustice, for all of the things that were in our lives that were not aligned with who you are. And we thank you for not just atoning for our sin and wiping that slate clean, but that you also opened for us a way back into right relationship with our God. That we can enjoy, we can know God and enjoy life with God all because of what you accomplished. That the, the curtain that separated us from God was torn in two because of your sacrifice on the cross. We love you. And we're so grateful for who you are and what you've done for us. And we will celebrate this until you return to take us home. We pray in your precious name. Amen. In a moment, I'll invite you to rise. We embed communion in worship. So as the worship team leads us in the next couple of songs, we'll invite you to come up the center aisle. Spin off to the right or the left. The person offering you the bread will say the body of Christ broken for you. And we invite you to respond, thanks be to God. You can take and eat. Then the cup will be offered, the blood of Christ shed for you, and we invite you to respond, and I will live for him. This is a twofold commitment. Gratitude for what Christ has done, thanks be to God, and a commitment to live going forward for him, and I will live for him. And if you forget the words, God sees your heart, and he finds. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's stand and worship together.
remind you, our prayer team is here. If you uh, would like to rage against the Lord, they would love to do that with you. May you go from this place in the knowledge of a God who loves you enough to let you bring your complaint against him, knowing he's big enough to handle it. Let's be honest before God and with one another. Go in his peace. Amen. <laughs>